thank you very much for the invitation to speak at uh, the Asia Pacific AIDS and Co-Infection Conference 2022. Um, I have been living with HIV since uh, 1994. Uh, that was my diagnosis. And uh, over the years, I have had the opportunity to learn a lot about uh, the disease, as well as uh, the opportunity to volunteer with uh, this organization, PLAS, Kuala Lumpur Aid Support Services Society, that is very close to my heart. So a lot of what you see today is actually from my uh, 28 years of survival and uh, the uh, journey that I've had um, has been, and it has uh, had its ups and downs, but it has given me a, a lot of life lessons that uh, have been in, immensely uh, important uh, to me. So when we have meet a patient uh, with HIV, they go through a lot of stages in their needs for uh, to recovery. Um, so they go through diagnosis, uh, post-diagnosis. These two are very important because most of the time in diagnosis, uh, there's not much you can do because um, some of them are not prepared for the, uh, the results of the test itself. Um, which is why post-diagnosis is very important because the, the moment they are referred to a treatment center, uh, they have to be engaged with uh, the counselors uh, and the, the peer support from NGOs alike. And then, of course, the patients themselves will go through a whole uh, period of questioning. They, think about their things that they should do, they should not do, their self-limitations, can they get a new job? Because uh, especially in, in places like Malaysia, there's still many uh, companies that request for a pre-employment test as well. So quitting the jobs, uh, moving away from the families and doing a lot of things that they normally wouldn't do that would upset their basic balance of life. But what we try to do is when we are able to engage with them at that point in time, it's very important to make sure that they have some form of stability and not change anything in their life as, uh, as much as far as possible. And then after several sessions of counseling, no, no matter how long their patient needs, when they finally come to acceptance that's when we can actually work with them to uh, move towards uh, taking care of their own health. Then when the doctors uh, feel it's necessary here, um, starting them on preparing how to take their medication pre-heart, actually starting heart, handling the side effects. And because in many countries in Asia, the range of medication may not be as advanced as in many Western countries. So the patients may feel a lot of side effects that many people in Western countries have already literally forgotten about. And, um, but here uh, in Malaysia, especially, we still have a lot of patients uh, complaining, providing us feedback on the side effects. And then after, the, the whole journey of challenge of the side effects and uh, taking the medication on time and worrying about misdoses. Uh, when they realize and they see the effects of the medication on their life and looking at the CD4 going up, the viral loads uh, reaching undetectable, it's very important for them to reach the realization that, hey, I'm still alive. And they start rebuilding their self-image, their self-confidence. They start reliving, connecting to what they've uh, given up all these years when, when they were first diagnosed. And that's when they can start looking towards the future, looking for life partners, starting a family, and getting the right advice. So 
what we do at the class, uh, as well as many other NGOs across the region, is to help the patients go through this journey. Because one thing that we do know is that when a person is diagnosed, stress affects them immensely. Stress and pressure from the diagnosis itself, the uh, issues of disclosure, of how to tell the partners, how to bring the partners into the testing. A lot of this uh, causes major um, mental health uh, issues for many patients. So uh, we have to make sure that we also are aware of the uh, challenges uh, and be able to refer them to uh, the uh, psychiatrists or counselors where necessary. So in the early years of HIV, where before there is uh, any medication, uh, we realized that the progression from infection to AIDS was quite swift. Uh, many young people lost their lives. And the, not only the progression of the disease uh, alone, but also accompanied with multiple opportunistic infections, as we know uh, of today. Uh, multiple opportunistic infections like uh, toxoplasmosis, um, uh, pulmonary tuberculosis, extra pulmonary tuberculosis as well. Um, a lot of uh, uh, cytomegalovirus uh, causing blindness, a lot of different things that affect the uh, patients over the years. We have fortunately seen less and less of it, but the, during those days, the common diagnosis at time of death was encephalopathy as well as dementia. So we know for a fact that um, AIDS Dementia Complex ABC has always been uh, sort of uh, uh, informed as uh, part of the uh, diagnosis of uh, point of death. So we know for a fact that HIV affects brain, the brain. And not only that, when we start uh, patients on treatment, we also have uh, treatment associated issues. Some of the side effects that the patients have to go through um, are, for example, ephemerans, uh, crossing the uh, blood brain barrier very easily. Patients uh, report things like vivid dreams, um, insomnia and uh, waking up the next morning feeling hungover, uh, like, like you've had a, a pinch drinking session the night before. Um, it doesn't help when they have to be uh, at the peak when they are actually uh, working and uh, it provides extra stress on them. Uh, medication like Zidovidin uh, affecting people with uh, underlying thalassemia as well, um, that affects the uh, red blood cells, as well as uh, tenofovir uh, affecting the kidney functions, which is why a lot of the doctors have to do regular renal function tests uh, for many of the patients. And medication like Pelletra, uh, Lopinavir, Lopinavir combination, that affects the kidney with patients reporting um, stomach problems, uh, issues, uh, feeling gas, uh, gassy, um, having diarrhea, things like that. But all these side effects are balanced with whether um, the patient has a genetic predisposition disposition to uh, experiencing many of these uh, uh, challenges associated with the uh, medication itself. So there is uh, good and bad in surviving long-term with HIV. Um, the bad first, uh, hand is something that uh, has been talked about and covered in many uh, research papers as uh, the audience here would, uh, would know. And chronic infections um, is something that I really don't need to elaborate a lot, especially with uh, vascular com comorbidities as well as metabolic comorbidities. Um, but the main thing that we should focus on is the balance of 
how do we save lives versus how do we provide a good quality of life? Because uh, the early days was challenging with patients having to take um, 20, 30 tablets a day um, at different intervals. There were BD doses, TD doses, and medication like uh, didanosine, those things, which had to be dissolved in water and taken uh, one hour before meals. So these were the kind of challenges that patients had to go through. Um, you didn't have a good quality of life because every single waking moment was used to figure out what combination of medication you had to take uh, at what time of the day. So your life literally revolved around your medication. And you, not being able to forget that you are living with HIV is definitely not a good quality of life. Um, so as patients survive, aging with HIV, we already know that HIV itself, uh, as well as the medication, causes premature aging. So a lot of us uh, are set to age beyond our, uh, another 20 years. Uh, so somebody with uh, HIV uh, who is in the 30s could be actually showing uh, aging of uh, somebody who is 50 years old. And uh, all this uh, is accompanied by blood pressure fluctuations that uh, are, are not the best things in the world, but the thing is that you have to take certain medication for this, uh, cardiovascular uh, issues, um, and uh, affecting the arteries. So the question is, how do we balance the severity of um, the disorders, whether it is um, mild, neurocognitive disorders or something a little bit more serious. So the toxicity of the medication, uh, accepting that that toxicity is actually allowing us to survive and grow older. And balancing the medicines that we take for our HIV versus the medicines that we will eventually take for aging as well. So Looking at preparing, in preparing for this uh, presentation, I also questioned uh, one very important element of how did I get here? How did I get to be the person who is presenting this to you today? How did I survive this 28 years knowing that um, I started with monotherapy in Zeki uh, back in the early days? That's the, the question that I went back to. Um, and I realized that what we need to do is we need to be reminded that we, especially in the, uh, who are providing counseling and support in NGOs alike, as well as treatment centers, we must be the bridge between the patient to, and as, uh, to their health. To, the, to better health. And at the same time, the, we must also realize that the treatment puzzle, it has to be solved because no matter how we have strong healthcare policies, well-equipped treatment centers, the widest range of medicines available for the physician to choose from in terms of choosing treatment, the latest diagnostics, uh, that we have in our labs, as well as the best doctors and nurses uh, and the, the most well-trained pharmacists. The key linking factor to this puzzle uh, to ensure longer health and suppression of the virus is the best patients. And in order to do that, we have to make sure that we balance our professionalism with empathy and ensure that whatever, in whatever we do, 
when we engage with the patient, we must communicate with our heart to show that we care. And so I give you um, my recommendation of how we can get there. What we need is what I call my formula of the five E's, which is to be able to engage with the patient, to educate them, to empower them, to enable them, and to encourage them. And that way, we can be effective in achieving what we want, which is better health for patients and also, also to stop chronic infections as well. In engaging the patient, we have to make sure that early intervention is available at all testing centers, at all treatment centers. Um, we have to make sure that treatment centers link up with uh, community health workers, uh, NGOs that are closest to them to provide the patients with uh, support systems that are uh, uh, absolutely necessary to understand the, the virus. And for the support systems, it's recommended that it should be geographically based because it's very important for people who are looking for support to be able to access um, support to, uh, groups uh, in their neighborhood um, somewhere where they can actually uh, get uh, link up with friends and go for a, a coffee or tea and actually talk about uh, different things um, as not only just um, the, the, the treatment itself. We need to educate them with strong basic information of what is HIV and what they can do to make sure that they survive. They need to look at uh, understanding treatment, which is a whole treatment literacy uh, module that uh, we at class have for our clients. So in order to do that, we must empower them to be responsible because the doctors and nurses cannot be with them 24 seven and cannot uh, provide them with support at two o'clock in the morning, whereas the, the peer, their case workers can. And even though they fa may face different challenges, they must be determined to continue their uh, medication and their treatment. The, we must enable them to take charge of their own health and to be able to uh, make sure that they have what they need to make the right decisions and to practice what they learn um, in terms of showing a good example to some of the newer patients as well. And then finally, we need to encourage them to make sure that the knowledge is shared with the other people who are newly diagnosed in the support group and to help doctors and nurses save other lives by paying it forward. So our goal is actually, has always been uh, to end AIDS by 2030. And to, in order to do that, we must prevent uh, default cases and must follow up and as well as halt onward transmissions by any means possible, whether it is through treatment, through PrEP, through condom and lube, and especially achieving a new improved skill. The how, know what works and to use it, follow the roadmap that we have and to provide true differentiated services, especially for marginalized populations. So we must get the communal viral load down to epidemical. Uh, the individual viral load is very important, but the communal viral load is the final goal. That's what we must do. Thank you very much.